Hello, welcome back. Our next speaker is a game development powerhouse, the chief creative officer of High Voltage Games, is that right? Yes. He's Eric Knopfsinger. He's credited with uh, 95 games. 95 games, dude. You've been start. in this for 22 years. Yes. Wow. And good 30, start. 30 animated releases. Yes. Was that like TV series? And yeah, t and uh, animated DVDs and that sort of thing. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Also, he's a very fun and smart guy. Um, aw awesome to talk to. So please do take the, the, uh, the not the chance, the, um, the, the use it. <laughs> <laughs> the opportunity, thank you. <laughs> Name that word. Um, right, so please welcome Eric and have a good time. So I thought I'd just start with uh with a couple of videos just to kind of frame what we might be talking about here, which is these games that we're doing in VR. Can you hear me? Good. the games that we're working on that I was going to show you guys and this other game that we are working on is this one which I'll show you kind of a lifestyle video which is kind of cheesy to be to be honest <laughs> but it does uh, as lifestyle videos are want to be but it does show a little bit about what this experience is like and what we're trying to encapsulate with that. Await your orders. You ready? Ready if you are. All right, prepare to be swore. I don't think so. Duty calls. <laughs> Check out this guy. Drop the affliction. Played. Best two out of three. Dragon Front. So this is 
those are the two games we've been doing for the last two years in VR. So, start this up. So, my talk is welcome to, um, my, w my talk is <laughs> relearning to walk in VR. And really what we want to get across here is just the different lessons and what the process in creating two original games specifically for VR um, over the last t two years. Um, the development lessons learned, the design challenges will be highlighted, including a uh, breakdown of where each needed to be adjusted from their original design specifically virtu for virtual reality. I'm Eric Knopfsinger. I'm Chief Creative Officer at High Voltage Software. I'm credited on <laughs> 95 games, and I've done 30 uh, DVD, releases, DVD releases. I've uh, had the experience to work with on a lot of different game genres over the years. Um, I'm an artist, I'm a musician, I'm a gamer, I'm a writer, I'm a nerd, and I'm a proud parent, and important for this presentation is I'm a VR fanatic. So, beginnings are hard, especially when there's no roadmap to follow. Um, Damage Core was our first VR project, and that image there is one of the first uh, concept pieces that we did. We knew that we had many considerations to start with. Um, new hardware that, um, you know, a lot of the specifications were unproven. Um, SDKs were being changed, um, not just daily, but a lot of times every few hours. Um, the, you know, VR even conceptually was an issue. Um, you know, we all had sort of these cyberpunk visions of um, fiction of what VR could be, and we'd all, frankly, been lied to quite a bit over the years with VR, and that it could be this amazing thing, and then we ended up with, like, the virtual boy. Um, and, you know, we we're kind of wrestling with the, that versus the practical reality of what hardware could possibly be. Um, we did a, a ton of experimentation. That's gonna be a recurring theme of the presentation here. Um, and really, um, other things we had to contend with was that something new is risky, and it's risky for business, and the bean counters usually don't like that too much. So um, you have to go into that with open eyes, knowing that anything you do, even today, um, is risky. So uh, be prepared to have a fair amount of waste. Um, we also needed to have buy-in from our publishing partner. Um, who was Oculus in, in this case. And um, fortunately, they were a very good partner for us and um, allowed us to try a lot of different ideas. And for the first game that we're focusing on here, Damage Core, it's a little bit more straightforward, but the, the next one, they allowed us to go uh, way out of what, what you would traditionally do in game development process, and I'll touch on that as well. And then um, finally, we had to prove each core element of um, of game of building a game so that we had a solid foundation. Um, if we didn't prove out those core fundamental elements, uh, what we'd be building on would be um, flawed and ultimately the whole experience would be for naught. So to start with, we knew we had to develop an understanding of the benchmark of uncomfortableness. And you know, we'd read, read a lot of white papers and done tons of discussions with Oculus about their findings. Um, and sort of their guidelines, best practices. Um, there seem to be a lot of indications that um, mismatches in, in a person's sensory input with their vestibular system um, made a lot of people ill. Uh, essentially, what's going on there is anytime your body has sensory input that's unaligned with your vestibular system, your body thinks it's poisoned. And so that's why you feel uh, sweaty. That's why you get these sort of hot flash, you get um, uh, a lot of times you feel nauseous. Um, it's, it's because you, your body is basically sa saying, you know, it needs to eject, it needs to get this out of your system, this toxin. Um, so you, you sweat profusely, you, uh, you feel like you're nauseous. And that was a very common thing. So it was something that we, that was our, our really our first uh, bullet point for uh, design was we knew that if people were physically uncomfortable, 
that they couldn't really have fun. Um, that seems obvious, but um, a lot of the things that you, you, we saw that were, people were experimenting with were just straight ports. And um, some of those things, they worked okay, but a lot of them were horrible. You know, we call them vomit rockets. They're like, you try them and, and you just immediately uh, feel uncomfortable. Uh, even for those of us that are very, um, you know, uh, insensitive to those kind of uh, those kind of experiences and uh, any kind of motion sicknesses, um, there were arguments that people would become more conditioned to VR sensitivity uh, in time, and I've seen some evidence of this. Um, we call that um, internally to our studio. We call it earning your your Oculus legs. Um, you know, sort of like a, a, you know, going out to sea as a sailor, you kind of, <laughs> you build a tolerance to it. Um, uh, but in, a, in, a, in the meantime, while, de while the developing, we had to keep, uh, keep our environment, um, you know, comfortable for this while people were working on this. And I'd, I'd advocate anyone in the room to keep in mind when you're, um, when you're developing things for VR, Keep your studio's temperature a little bit on the cool side. The, um, it does help. Um, other things are keeping, hand, keeping uh, readily available for all your employees. Uh, ginger candy or any kind of motion sickness treatments um, are a good idea to, to have on hand. Any of that stuff is, uh, really does help quite a lot. Um, uh, having said that, um, as mentioned in previous uh, topics here, some of the, one of the main things that really helps with the combating nausea and general um, unease is targeting a solid 90 frames a second, uh, stereoscopic with 360 uh, degree gameplay, and that's difficult. That's, uh, those are very high specifications even for, um, for, the, for the specifications that are, you know, outlined by the, by both um, on the Vive and the Oculus. But uh, once we got that baseline of comfort, we could begin prototyping. Um, research and development is important for VR, um, but more important is understanding failure. And, um, and that's really critical to the process. The old adage of fail fast, fail early holds true here. Um, we've successfully shipped a lot of console games and a lot of PC games, but we've, uh, we can honestly say that this is the most disruptive Technology that I've been a uh, that we've been a part of in our in our careers at high voltage. Um, it's not just a uh, buzzword. Disruptive gets thrown out a lot, but this really is a transformative technology. Um, you know, I put this akin to the transition from uh, from 2D to 3 3D ge geometry and 3D graphics and games. And I actually say it's m it's more uh, challenging and problematic than that transition for game studios and for studios in general. Um, we spent two months just trying to get um, uh, just trying things out. Um, we set up sub teams of um, folks that could just experiment and try different things out in these one week sprints, where um, where we could just explore and see what ideas would stick. And from there, we started to compile, compile lists of what worked and what didn't work. Um, but that list is written in pencil, and we knew that we would con we'd be continually modifying it, and we're still modifying it to this day. Um, for first VR game, we landed on a shooter as a genre, which was pretty obvious there. But the, um, one of th the things that might not be so obvious is some, some things uh, did work right out of the gate, and some things uh, didn't work at all, and we needed to really question the why uh, those things worked or didn't work. Um, we had some of the following findings that um, scoping or using a scope is technically a lot more challenging than we'd initially anticipated. Um, traditionally, in, in uh, a shooter, you essentially you throw an X on this in the middle of the screen, and you're, and you're done for your, for your uh, targeting reticule, right? Um, in uh, VR, not only are you, <laughs> you render, and specifically in scoping, not only are you um, rendering at 90 frames a second, and that needs to be s constant, uh, stereoscopic, um, but you, uh, you're also, when you're in scope, you're, doing, you're rendering that uh, picture in picture, so you're, you're eff effectively, you're doubling that. And, um, you could cheat and just do it as a, as a, uh, a monocular image in the middle of the screen, 
But we found that that, that really kind of uh, destroyed the effect and it really wasn't very immersive. So we went to a stereoscopic picture within a stereoscopic picture, which was even more challenging. And then things like where I mentioned just throwing an X in the middle of the screen like you typically would do in a shooter, that, you know, that doesn't work in VR because if you're just throwing a, a 2D decal in space, it, it universally makes people cross-eyed um, because it's an, at an arbitrary depth. Um, what you really have to do in that instance is you raycast out to a, to a point in sp to the point at which you're actually targeting the, the, the thing that you're going to hit and then you're, you're scaling that in real time so that from the user's perspective it looks like it's constantly at the same size and in the same space but actually it's being, it's being drawn out onto the, onto the physical object you're going to hit and, um, and that actually feels quite comfortable. Um, so there's just there's a lot of things like that that we just had to iterate and see what what worked and what didn't work. And other things that just didn't work at all was uh, traditional twin stick movement. Um, I, I don't know if any of you have tried any other uh, games that were just ported over first person shooters ported to to VR, but they're they're really nauseating. And uh, if you do try them, I'd uh, be prepared to take a long walk after that to reset yourself because they're they're not fun. Uh, even for those of us that play a lot of shooters. Um, but the things that do work are things like, you know, shooting itself was very, fat, uh, very satisfying, and we found that uh, aiming with your head is surprisingly accurate, um, way more accurate than we would have expected. We, we thought that, you know, a uh, traditional mouse kind of keyboard layout that was, you know, incredibly precision, but actually just moving your head as a targeting device is, is surprisingly very, very accurate in these devices. And, um, and the things like focusing on distant targets gave us more control, and we were able to f sort of fake other elements of the game while we sorted out other gameplay mechanics. So we began prototyping with scoping and how to, how to do that to make a shooter um, uh, this was a, a bit of a massive risk for us, uh, but it also had the potential of being a massive payoff. Um, with no movement, um, because we found that that was nauseating, uh, and no close qu quarters combat with a focus on scope, the natural result was initially uh, as a demo to, to make a sniping game. Like a, uh, but um, in making a sniping game, um, we showed this off as a VR demo at E3. Uh, we were one of a handful of games that were featured uh, and shown at Oculus' booth. Um, we got great reactions from this, both from, uh, from press, from our publisher, and from the public, and that was really cool. Um, but in the back of our mind, we knew that we had to do, um, although we had a good thing, we needed to do a lot more. Um, that this kind of gameplay while it did work in a, in a nice game mechanic loop uh, and it was fun, it, it just didn't fit with modern um, game tastes. It, w it, felt, uh, very, it felt very much like an old style arcade sniper game, like, uh, like a silent scope or something like that, which is, which is, um, which is okay, but it felt like it would, it would uh, get stale over time and it did. And so that was where we really had to go back to the drawing board and begin again with uh, movement and how we were going to sort that out uh, to make something that would be compelling because we wanted to make something that wasn't just um, a viewmaster or something that was a novelty that people could play once and then they might show it to their friends but then be done with it. We wanted to make full game experiences that people were going to want to play over and over. So um, although this was fun and it was fresh and it, was, uh, it, it did work really well to have this loop of sniping. Um, we started looking into the, this movement mechanic and, and uh, experimenting with a lot of different types of, of movement. Um, many of them uh, didn't work and we tried things from you know, limiting peripheries during movement, um, which some other companies have done this to certain uh, degrees of success. Uh, but it still didn't feel right. We tried a lot of different things, and ultimately we landed on um, on teleportation. And uh, it was an odd one, but it, it actually felt very comfortable. 
uh, even to people that were very motion sensitive. We found that the uh, hopping from, from point to point in space, actually uh, people were totally okay with that. So although we had no nausea issues at that, we did feel like it was, uh, it did feel a little cheap that, that you were rooted in place, that you were teleporting to a spot and then you were rooted because, um, so we wanted something to, to, we looked at that and how we could make that more uh, quicker, more free form, and, um, and we, so we started uh, developing different ideas with that. One of the things was we looked at um, a dynamic facing system to tackle disorientation because that was a, a thing that really slowed people down. They would, they would hop to a new point, but then um, unless you were like inherently that was, that was uh, you were, had a very good sense of direction and you could look at a, a point and know if I hop there, I'd be, you know, I'm going to be facing this way. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't natural to a lot of players, and we found that a lot of people got confused as to where they were. And we had to do a lot of things in our environments to help make sure that people always knew where they were facing. But we also, uh, we tackled it with a dynamic facing system, and we toggled that on and off because some players actually found that annoying as well. But, uh, but the, it seemed like that was the best uh, overall solution was uh, dynamically or reorienting a player in a direction where something interesting would be going on so that they did feel like they were always, you know, when they were moving, it w made sense. Um, we also needed some kind of game concept that, that married this idea with, the, uh, with teleporting around and scoping and shooting. Um, in itself, that was, you know, uh, that narratively that needed to have some kind of purpose and it needed to have some kind of gameplay hook to that. Um, you know, the idea of necessarily teleporting to a space uh, was interesting, but we also, we landed on the idea that we thought was a little bit kind of a cyberpunky thing and a nod to what got us inspired about VR in general, which was the idea that as a player you play as a virus and you're able to uh, as a piece of software, you're actually able to transfer your consciousness into different robot forms throughout this world, and that really became our hook, is by each robot body that you could inhabit, then you would, you would gain the abilities of that robot that you were in. And that, that to us felt like that was interesting. Um, and then part of that, too, is we, we really discovered that, that the controls had to be very simple. Um, this might seem like an obvious thing, but one of the things we noted uh, is even the most hardcore of gamers, which we knew would be the earliest adopters of this technology, but um, even if they felt like they, they never looked at a controller when they played, we found that universally they did, at least to orient, orient their hands in space. And we, we did uh, integrate a 3D model of hands and 3D model of uh, controller in, in the play space, but even then, people would get confused about, you know, exactly what the button orientation, and that was a frustrating thing uh, for them. So we found that we needed to greatly simplify uh, control inputs, and, um, and that really did help a lot. So some of the things that we discovered in the, uh, this E3 demo was um, distance uh, greatly reduces stereoscopic uh, 3D effects. So, um, you know, th although we'd have stuff that was uh, further out in distance, um, that wasn't very um, that wasn't very impressive. Uh, as it's further out in space, it, it, it sort of flattens out inherently. And then uh, fixed positions of for players to jump to are uh, are easy to make, but they're hard to make fun. So that was something that we we did a lot of uh, research and. In, in, and uh, development to making sure that each, each uh, starting position of a robot would be someplace interesting and something interesting was going on. Um, movement is, uh, is very hard in VR, um, but it adds, adds to fun and gamers expect this. Um, it's one of the things that a lot of times when you see things and we're, some of the responses we got early on from uh, some of the first things we showed is, Players were like, this is really cool. I, of, I only wish I could move around. And um, they don't really know what they don't, uh, what doesn't work because they've not experienced it. And if, they, if you gave them exactly what they wanted, which was this twin stick 
traditional movement, it would universally make them sick. Um, so that was, that was obviously a, a, a great challenge. Um, but some things in VR are more interesting, um, which is that um, things, when they're closer to you, uh, get quite interesting, especially things that travel over you. We started introducing uh, enemies that would jump over you at close distances and things like that. Like this, this guy here on the screen, he is a jammer and he not, not has several different mechanics, but he jumps over you. And people universally, the first time they see that, they're, they're, um, they're wowed by it. There's certain kinds of uh, things that have kind of become hackneyed and cliched in, in, in 3D movies that I would encourage everyone to explore in VR because it's, it's all new again. Um, so, um, you know, scoping in, 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 uh, in VR does m make things appear closer, which is a nice proxy for fun, but actually th things being closer is way more immersive. Um, the thing that you have to be cognizant of is if you make it too close to, your, to, your, uh, to, to the user that they actually start to feel discomfort. Um, you, if you, it, there's a balancing act and you really have to t fine tune this when uh, things are at a certain level, they, they actually feel very immersive, but once they get, they invade your personal space, uh, people universally feel like that's too, too much. So we had all these, um, we had this, uh, this game mechanics and we had lots of really cool robots. They were designed, we, uh, we have this amazing concept artist that we got from, um, from Retro, uh, who'd worked on the, the Metroid Prime games and Donkey Kong Country Returns, and he came up with all these amazing designs for really interesting, unique robots. And, um, you know, that, that was great, but we also needed to, uh, we needed to, and we had this, this idea of the player a software, and we would tie into this uh, cyberpunk VR appeal. Um, where you're as a virus, but we wanted to, um, and we knew that these things could be cool in a fight, um, but it made, it, one of the things that made it uh, more challenging and interesting was uh, ways to get people to continue to move in the space, because one of the things we found was uh, a lot of players, they would get in these things, and uh, they would be very powerful, and, um, you know, it, we, we wanted them to make fun and tactical decisions of different robots to jump into, but w we found that once they spent too much time in a rooted place, then, then they would get back to the, that mindset of, I'm not moving, I'm in these fixed spaces. So we introduced the concept of um, uh, decay over time, where the, the, when you enter into these new bodies, that you have a limited amount of time, depending on which thing it is, you're sort of overloading the system of it. And you have a limited amount of time that you can be in this, in this vessel, and that kept players continually moving. Um, and once they got trained in how to do this, it became very fluid. Um, now we had to build this uh, giant world where all this thing could work and um, players could go anywhere and be anything, which um, was um, no, no small amount of pressure for the designers. Um, the results were that we ended up with a full-featured uh, uh, game that uh, takes a typical person 10 to 12 hours to, to complete. Um, this experience was designed from the ground up and it's something that we're very proud of. Uh, th we think it's a visual showpiece for, uh, for the hardware, and it's a full-featured game. You know, some of the outcomes that we, uh, and the learning lessons that we had from this was that uh, UI and um, uh, user interface and heads-up display are very difficult uh, in VR and uh, require a lot of additional time. Um, a lot of these elements you know, uh, when you use them as 2D elements, they just look weird. You, you have to make, make them as 3D objects in space and they have to have uh, physical properties. Otherwise, um, you know, those tropes of games, that language of games of just throwing up health bars or things like that, they just, they, they, people don't accept them and it immediately breaks the concept of presence. Um, player communication as a rule is difficult uh, especially when a lot's happening around the player, you know, sort of echoing back to an earlier um, talk, um, you know, the chaos of battle uh, is 
far more chaotic in VR, and uh, really everything is cranked up in intensity. So, um, and tied to that, even really simple things in VR can be cool. So letting the player just look around is actually really, really valuable and something that we found um, that players would, send, would spend uh, a lot of time just, just looking at things. And um, so part of that was learning as game developers to give up control. Um, we're used to developing games where we you know, sort of lead players with carrots to look over here or do this thing. And those techniques really don't work very well in VR. You have to uh, trust the player to want to see cool stuff and let them let their own thing unfold for them, and um, it takes a different mindset. Um, in you know, you you allow narrative and different elements to be there. If the player discovers it, great. If they don't, that's that's okay too. And it's just a very different way to approach um, storytelling and uh, and gameplay in general. Um, you know, part of that is not being afraid to let the players miss stuff. Um, they'll be having fun. Um, so, and you can handle the rest of what's going on in the game. It's, um, and you can trigger things off of when you do know the player. Wait until the player does look at the thing that you want and then wait to trigger it then as opposed to, because you always know when they're look, looking at something, which is a, a luxury you don't have in, in traditional games. Um, and l like I said before, everything intensifies in VR. So that includes uh, dev development challenges, uh, time to iterate, amount of knowledge gained, for f gained from failure, really everything. And you, you definitely have to plan it accordingly. Um, everything just takes a lot more time in VR. Um, you know, whatever you think it's gonna take, uh, double it and then double it again. So Dragonfront's our second major VR title and had a very different approach. Um, instead of taking just straight up some kind of major um, gaming experience um, like a first person shooter and trying to make that work for VR, what we're, our core concept was we wanted to uh, recreate the experience of a tabletop game with uh, you and a friend playing across the table from each other and representing that in VR. Um, this was one of the first concepts we did that where we were like, we wanted to catch a, capture that magic. A lot of us were big tabletop, v, tabletop gamers and we loved playing with miniatures and loved playing those kind of games across each other, like playing card games and different things like that. We felt like there was a real magic in that and a social connected experience that uh, really people weren't exploring in VR. And then, um, you know, aesthetically, our, um, our inspiration was, you know, we wanted to do this, we didn't want to just do a traditional high fantasy game. Um, I'd had an idea years ago where uh, I wanted to cross high fantasy with sort of a diesel punk inspiration to create a new language that felt, was sort of like a fantasy of the familiar. It felt like something that could be, you know, people could get but, um, you know, but uh, would, would be new. And, um, you know, we feel pr like we landed on something pretty good there. And this was something, this art style was something that, we, you know, uh, myself and some of the concept artists were working on for more than a year before we ever started this. So it was, it was an opportunity for us to explore this. So this is where, um, fortunately, Oculus was just crazy enough to let us do this. Um, this is very different than uh, how games are traditionally made, or uh, video games. But it's something that we were, you know, we were able to actually uh, prototype in paper first. We made a full, fully playable miniatures card game before we ever went digital with this. Um, we developed the entire game um, using, uh, first we used card stock and, and uh, uh, you know, sc doodling down things. We allowed, it allowed us to have a very small team nail down uh, the gameplay with a, lot, uh, with a lot smaller impact to budget. And then one of the si notable side effects that was very positive was we were able to, um, we were able to, we were able to, a lot of things that because they worked in the physical realm, those were things that we were able to sort of work out how they would work uh, represented in, in a digital realm. Um, we had a lot of other things like, you know, outside of the basic mechanics and, the, and deck building and things like that, we had a first pass of our, of our balance of this stuff and that was, that was much cheaper than, than doing this in a, in a digital form. 
And yeah, this picture is completely posed and bogus, I know. So, um, as well as, um, you know, the, uh, this whole process of making this along, uh, congruent to that, we were, uh, we did our pre-production of art. Card games um, require a lot of art. And uh, uh, we wrote the descriptions and characters, uh, came up with the, which there's over 420 character models in this game. Um, fortifications, we have over 80 fortifications in this game. Um, spells, there's more than 100 spell types. Um, and started conceptualizing all this. This was a whole lot of drawings. This was thousands and thousands of drawings that we were doing in a relatively s short period of time. Um, using these descriptors, outside of the small concept group that we had internally, um, you know, a lot of this outsource this this concept was done by outsourcing we couldn't have done it without um, going with a lot of trusted partners that we had globally uh, to do this because of the the sheer volume of work once we'd established the style and established all this thing it allowed us to hand this out to a lot more hands uh, than we had we had hundreds of concept artists working on this there was no other way to do this in, the, in our time constraints So we brought, um, once we had this, uh, as part of the pre-production, uh, we brought the, at this point, we actually had updated the physical form where we actually had a printable version of this game that was ready for, uh, that we could actually take to mass production, where we, we were printing out thousands of cards at this point, um, actual cards and putting them in binders, and it was sort of nirvana for me, where I was able to make, this was a dream to be able to make miniatures and make a board game and do all this and uh, uh, have somebody um, supporting you in doing this. And we took this to uh, Gen Con, which in, um, which in uh, America is a, a pretty big gaming conference and uh, uh, focused mainly on pen and paper um, and tabletop gaming. And we were able to work with creators of other big collectible card games and board games to get their expert insight. So we, we hired a lot of people because we knew, although we always wanted to do this kind of game and we made a lot of digital games, we weren't so, um, we weren't so full of hubris to believe that we were going to be able to get this right out of the gate and not have those learnings from other people that were far more experienced in making those physical games than we were. And we got a lot of good insight from that. At the same time, we were also uh, writing a lot of lines of dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue that goes into this, um, and so we had writers working on that. So the design, and the design department also wrote all the documentation and, and functional specifications so that people could actually do this, so there's, uh, and all the programmers could work on them. So um, what you see here uh, is one of the first digital uh, 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 representations that we did, um, and this was still part of pre-production, but we were we were starting uh, look at what engines we should that would best fit our needs and would support VR, because we'd done a little bit of stuff in proprietary engines, and you know one of the things I would say um, uh, and advocate to anyone that hasn't jumped into VR yet, definitely use a, if at all possible use an off-the-shelf engine. Um, there's um, we, our initial attempts to do this with proprietary engines were, um, were not good, <laughs> to say the least. These, um, these SDKs uh, that um, the different hardware manufacturers are, they're being updated so frequently right now that uh, you will need to dedicate a programmer to doing nothing but supporting that. And that's, that's costly. Whereas, uh, and we'll, you'll have a lot of downtime. Whereas if you're using an off-the-shelf engine like Unity or Unreal or Crytek, um, these engines will, they'll do that work for you. And so you'll essentially, you'll have a lot more uptime of having your game just work. Um, so um, initially the programmers made a simple card generation tool in C++, C Sharp rather, um, that allowed us to design and update paper cards very, very quickly. Uh, we could change stats, we could, we could generate new things, and uh, it allowed us to iterate very quickly. We also were able to um, generate some tools that allowed us to more programmatically run through variables because we knew there was a ridiculous number of variables that even if we had armies of testers working on, which we did, uh, it still would never be enough. Um, 
And our programmers began uh, detailing the requirements for networked multiplayer, a project like this that included servers, matchmaking, and security. After solidifying this, this core design, um, we started to generate the environment in VR. Um, this wasn't uh, quite as simple as we'd hoped as just doing the cards on a computer and had a, had a few of the following challenges. Um, a perfecting, perfecting a camera angle and position uh, uh, for a game like this is, is very critical. Um, proving a sense of scale without occluding the, the board um, and necessary player information, um, which there's a lot in these kind of things, the different information that needs to come up is difficult as well. Uh, again, even uh, arguably these sorts of games are, they're all UI, and UI is one of the most challenging things in VR. Um, you know, so, and displaying this information in easy to understand format, and uh, focusing on uh, player input in a very simplified format, because again, uh, functionally the player is blind. You know, they're, they're putting on a, a headset, they're not able to see, and we wanted to support not just only uh, a controller, but we wanted to support a simple input device, which is essentially like a little little remote control. We wanted to, it to be as few uh, button inputs as possible, uh, so that the player wouldn't have to, you know, uh, actually see what they were doing, and it would become very second nature. Um, so, and then a thing that was actually ended up taking a lot of time was giving a a, a player sense of scale. And it's something to take into account any, any kind of game that this you're making is um, giving the player a sense of uh, that presence that they're actually at uh, in a play space um, across from a digital table uh, against the opponent. Uh, one of the things you're going to have to spend a lot of time getting right is the inter interpupillary distance um, and adjusting that to get that right, to get the scale. Um, it's one of the things, if you've ever seen uh, stop-motion movies, they spend a lot of time getting that right to get the scale where, where you actually have that sense that you are, you are in a real-world scale and things are towering over you and that things are very small. Um, and that's a function of getting that distance of your eyes correct. Um, this took tons of iteration. Uh, to Not only to get that right, but also to make sure that the players didn't feel sick. Um, so once we had our world and our camera, we moved into generating uh, the play space, the board, which was a four by four grid. We imported a, a, a basic model to represent all of the 240 characters, the core characters, and, um, and started uh, spawning it uh, on the board with a, with a clear movement rule set. Um, at first our characters would simply spawn, move, and attack. And it was a while before they had special traits or, or any kind of visual effects and different things like that. And then, of course, we kept uh, iterating on the HUD and the, and the gameplay elements and the positioning of these. Um, design then uh, attempted to mirror the player's perspective from our, uh, from our paperboard um, iterations. And uh, to foster that VR experience, we needed to bring player characters um, and effects to the player. So um, we needed the spells and things, not just to target what was going on there, but when catapults went off or dragons flew by or things like that, we wanted them to fly by the characters. Again, so, sort of hearkening back to the sort of cliched hackney day does, uh, days of the earliest days of, of 3D movies. Um, that stuff actually works really well in VR. Things like particulates and things like that that everyone takes for granted in games you know, any kind of particle systems. Particles are magical in VR. Anything that's, that's volumetric like that, they, that you can see through, um, but they're also expensive. And, and going back to the technical side of that, you have to, you have to be, make sure you're doing things through either mesh-based mesh systems or doing, you know, you have VFX artists that are very good at optimizing effects. Um, so uh, the, along that lines, also examined cards. Um, I don't know if one of the things you uh, could see from the video was, you know, we, we wanted the sense of that uh, these cards, they would be a portal that you could look through into that world and see a living um, uh, character so you could examine it up close. 
because we thought that would be a lot more interesting. Um, we wanted to have things like when uh, one of the component gameplay components is there's a champion system, so the player has a, a big champion that they can pull out uh, and it, it turns sort of the, the battle around. And having that big, um, that champion character, we wanted that character to acknowledge you. And um, that was something that we found was very magical too, that when you look down on the play space and have those miniatures actually acknowledge you and seem to be res responding to where you're looking, suddenly felt like a, a living toy box. Um, you know, everything on the, on the game, game board and, and the things that we're doing digitally started to come to life and they started to become much more magical at this point. We started to zero in on the things that would make that experience more immersive. So it really shouldn't be any great surprise that one of the largest hurdles with a collectible card game is that with 420 cards is testing and balancing and tweaking that out. And I have a light, great deal of respect for people that, that uh, do these kind of th things. And um, honestly, if I, if I could go back hindsight being 2020, I think we would have spent a lot more time uh, and even pulled in more people to work on this. Um, the team spent the, has spent the last few months uh, solely testing this game and running through stress tests. We've done a lot of focus testing. Um, other things that are difficult that I would really highly recommend a lot of time on uh, for iteration and focus testing is uh, tutorial. Uh, tutorializing things is uh, is very difficult in VR. Um, I mean, tutorial is boring and, and um, usually is, ends up being the last thing that, that uh, people consider in making the games. But actually, um, in, this is a whole new medium and with it, I can't stress enough how much time that you, that you need to spend on that. Um, you know, the other things is we, with this, uh, with the system of the getting, getting data and starting to uh, analyze what was there, we needed to uh, I implement a, a real analytic system to track and measure all these, all these cards and the combinations, see which things were win-loss ratios, what things were um, unbalanced uh, from a data perspective, not just purely our, our gut, but actually what, was th what the data was telling us. And uh, this also translated to putting a lot of efforts into a back end uh, where we're collecting this information on user purchases um, because another thing that made this whole thing challenging is this will be the first uh, that we know of free to play uh, game like this. So it's, which is also a huge gamble where you're essentially you're giving a game away like this. It took a lot of effort to develop. Uh, we wanted to make sure that what we had was fair, but at the same time that we could somehow generate some sort of revenue from this. Uh, so we were collecting information on the purchases and uh, what, how users were crafting um, in-game uh, decks, um, collecting information on, on player retention, matching making success, um, making sure that we're matching people with, with the same level of players. And um, and all the things of which you know which faction of the different factions we have on the the core core set that's going to release with this has four uh, four primary factions, and we have uh, plans that go out for a long time for additional content beyond that. Much of that content we've already been working on for some time. So in the end. Um, you know, Dragonfront's been a, a reasonably smooth development process, all things considered. Um, and this can be attributed largely to um, a great deal of understanding and respect of the platform as something that we, we don't know what we're doing. That was really the, the big, the first initial assumption is everybody had to assume that no matter how experienced they were at making games, that they know nothing and they need to challenge everything. And, um, and we did. Um, we also would attribute the success we've had to this so far as to having um, uh, proving the mechanics out on paper first. Um, you know, anything that you can prove out in a physical sense, I'd, I'd, this was highly successful for us and I would say carved out many, many months of development. Um, having a strong conceptual foundation was important to us. Um, you know, really the the, this whole idea of two people playing across the table from each other, having that as a core, it allowed us to have a unique vision and be able to, to constantly measure that. And it, when we were making decisions, we'd always question, does this make it more like 
me playing across the table from a f with a friend. And if it didn't, then maybe we didn't need it. Um, and so, and then having a, a plan from the start, uh, sticking to that plan, but also <laughs> knowing that that plan needed to be written in pencil and be willing to change it, uh, pivot often. Um, so the final result was we made the, we've made the, fir the world's first uh, VR collectible card game. Uh, it's a massive game with a lot of depth. Uh, a match takes about, in this game, a match takes about 15 minutes. But we found that players play many, many matches and uh, come back to it. And we knew we had something when, um, you know, when we were, um, when our publishing partner Oculus, uh, when Jason Rubin or uh, Palmer Lucky, they were uh, contacting us, asking us when the n when we'd be when they'd be getting the new cards or when they would you know, and we'd have they'd be sending us pictures of them in in uh, airport terminals uh, playing the game and pointing things out to us, and we'd be talking to them over the weekend, and it became uh, much bigger than the initial concept. That once it became much bigger than ourselves. We knew that we, we had something that was really special. Um, and then pro a final note to this and what we came up with is, uh, is really we landed on the, the notion that, that we believe that VR isn't, isn't going to be a, what's really going to succeed in VR is not going to be insular um, uh, singular experiences, but we believe that uh, social connected experiences are going to be the things that really uh, break through. Um, there's a magic when you're playing a game and seeing us, another player's avatar and seeing how they're reacting to it. Um, if any of you haven't seen videos of things like uh, Dead and Buried um, that'll be coming out on Oculus with touch controller, I've had some great experiences playing that with, uh, um, with, with other people, um, other Oculus developers, um, where, you, where you have these uh, experiences where um, you, c you couldn't script it. There, it's an obviously another live person, and it's like a real-time motion capture of another person engaging with you. Those experiences you can't can. Um, people are hardwired for these very subtle differences. Your reptile brain can look at this and they can smell it a mile away when that's just when it's a machine or an AI. They even the most sophisticated AIs take a long time to look stupid. And um, when, when you see another person reacting and adapting to how you're playing, that's powerful. Um, so that, I think that's the final note on that, is we just really think that VR, not just for games, but for uh, VR in general, we think it's going to be these social connected experiences that are going to make it more powerful in general and a, and a new medium. So that's pretty much all I have. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for letting me drone on. Thanks for letting me keep you from beer. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to shout them out. Otherwise, that's my email address there. And if, uh, feel free to email me. I'm, and this is how we all learn from each other and uh, make this medium successful. So that's all I got. Awesome. Thank you so much. Do you guys have any questions for Eric? That's a surprise. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, are, are both of those games available now? Both of these games will be available very soon. We're looking at a, a July 29th release for, um, for Damage Core, and we'll be going into, a, into an open beta around the same timeline for, uh, for Dragon Front. And then from there, it'll go into uh, You guys have release. this email for the open yeah. data. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any of you that, if send me your Oculus IDs. And thanks for sharing your email. That's, that's not normal. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Eric. Thanks. Eric Nuffsinger.